You only have to go to a big survey show of contemporary art, like the Whitney Biennial in New York, to see that it's all become rather bloated. Artists seeking to make an impact with an instant hit, anything to stand out from the crowd, anything that says, look, here I am, I have arrived, I am different. Whatever it is, it's about making an immediate impact, about fast, gettable, and sellable images. Shit, man, this is what they used to do in Notting Hill Gate in 1964. The trouble is, you know, if you live long enough and you're in a culture of revivals, in the end, nothing is new. It's as though Western art began with Andy Warhol. In this atmosphere, artists are treated like stars. Social glamour is the criterion for star quality. Andy Warhol did more than any other artist to turn the art world into the art business. Although his late work descended into feeble, repetitious kitsch, the main message of his career came through very loud and very clear. And it was that the primary model of art was fashion. His paintings, tremendously stylish in their rough silk screening, mimicked the dissociation of gaze and empathy induced by the mass media. The banal punch of tabloid newsprint, the visual jabber and the bright sleazy colours of TV, the sense of glut and anaesthesia caused by both. Two Elvises are better than one, and one Marilyn, patched like a gaudy stamp on a ground of gold leaf, could become a sly and grotesque parody of the Virgin Mary fixations of Warhol's own Catholic childhood, of the pretentious enlargement of media stars by a secular culture, and of the similarities between both. I want to be a machine, said Andy. Well, he didn't quite succeed in this high ambition, probably no artist can, but he did leave this strange legacy whereby artists who came after him engaged obsessively in the production of serial novelties. Today, the closest thing to Warhol's factory with its army of assistants is the studio of Jeff Koons. I wanted to meet Coons because he is probably the most famous living artist in America. Born in Philadelphia in 1955, Coons started very young by rearranging the items in the window of his father's shop. He financed his art by earning money as a commodity trader on the New York Stock Exchange and began his artistic career by putting consumer items in plexiglass boxes anything from vacuum cleaners to basketballs. A trick he'd learnt from Marcel Duchamp, an artist who made his name with ready-made sculpture in the teens and twenties of the last century. In the mid-1980s, Coons concentrated on reproducing stainless steel model trains that had once contained Jim Beam whiskey. He dabbled in a laundered and winsome kind of pornography after his marriage to the Italian politician and porn star Cicciolina with a series called Made in Heaven. He then duplicated advertising images of luxury goods, directing his assistants to paint exact replicas for a purpose that I've never really been able to fathom. Like Warhol, he hooks onto the ad mass imagery of an age and tries to turn it into iconography. His statues of subjects like the Pink Panther are kitchified into porcelain like in large souvenirs. He uses the same technique with religion, such as this copy from Leonardo, a statue of John the Baptist, 
as though his work and Leonardo's were in some sense one and the same. Religion has diminished into celebrity, a kind of reverse apotheosis made most clearly in his sculpture of Michael Jackson and his pet monkey, Bubbles. I saw uh, Michael at the time as somebody that uh, really would do anything for his art, uh, somebody that was just transforming himself. He wanted a large audience. And at the same time, the, the public seemed so hungry for this too. You know, Michael really was a, a symbol of the kind of the celebrity culture and everything that we look to that culture for. I mean, this deals with uh, kind of this Christ-like quality of, you know, of putting somebody in this type of uh, situation. Uh, but um, well, here he is saving the soul of this little ape. <laughs> well, I think it has to do with uh, a sense of uh, evolution and a sense of eternity. But I think there's, there's tragedy in this piece, and I think the tragedy was always there. There was tragedy in what Michael was doing to himself. Uh, there was always this, this tragedy of how culture looks to uh, the celebrity. I was really thinking about Renaissance sculpture. I was thinking about the Vatican and how the Vatican's used art, and this is within that tradition. But I was thinking of uh, Michelangelo ah. and uh, the Pieta. Ah. Kunz's act, which is not perhaps even an act, is to believe that he is a natural descendant of the great artists of the past, interpreting religious iconography with a kind of contemporary twist, but aspiring to the same level of eternal fame and truth. Perhaps if you mention your name in the same sentence as Michelangelo's, people will begin to see you in the same light. And if you then go to Italy and hire lots of craftsmen to work for you, using the same materials, then you can start taking yourself even more seriously. I saw Masaccio's expulsion, and that was really kind of the, the genesis of uh, the Made in Heaven work. Uh, I was really moved by the expulsion, and I guess uh, I felt... But the expulsion is a deeply pessimistic, even tragic image. I mean, here are these people... Adam and Eve, who have just lost everything. They've lost all their sources of happiness. They're being thrown out. Uh, what relation does that have to yours? Well, but humankind. I mean, we're in that state since that moment, and uh, to deal with that uh, state. And so uh, people have uh, guilt and shame, and uh, my work has dealt with guilt and shame for a long time. Sex is a fairly common theme in Kunz's work. Sometimes it's moderately subtle, sometimes it's quite explicit, and at other times it's rather confusing, a woman in a bath with the top of her head cut off, surprised by an underwater diver with a snorkel. I tried to relate that cultural guilt and shame to guilt and shame that people have about masturbation. And most young children come in contact with their bodies when they take a bath. And do both of these come together in this girl as a masturbation image and in covering her breasts? Well, uh, it's kind of different. I mean, the sense of the bathtubs there, uh, the guilt and shame is, I think, that the viewer feels too, because I think you want to participate, the viewer, in the victimization that's happening here. I mean, she's startled, she's trying to protect herself, but yet, you know, this finish here, it's so sensitive. I mean, I want to touch the hands, mm -hmm. I, I want to touch her arm. And uh, so it has that sense of quality that uh, the medium, kind of this victim, victimizer uh, role that's taking place here. Mm -hmm. But the uh, voyeur or interferer or whatever he is actually is also cut off, isn't he? I mean, there's no way that he could fit in there. That's correct. You know, I guess maybe this is us uh, that's, you know, underneath there in the snorkel. Today, Coons and his assistants are working on a series of large children's toys, playing with materials, inflating dogs and lobsters, and then recasting them in aluminium so that they acquire weight and a sort of gravitas. Nobody questions the work because Coons's lock on the market is so thorough. His woman in a tub sold for 1.7 million, the Pink Panther for 1.8 million dollars, the train of whiskey bottles for 5 million. Over the last 25 years, I've been amazed at the rise in prices and the sheer volume of the art market. A hundred million dollars for a Picasso removes the work from public currency. It says, look, I can belong only to the super rich, 
and all other Picassos are just the same. This alienation of the work from the common viewer is actually a form of spiritual vandalism, a cultural obscenity. What on earth is going on? <laughs>